Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to the last session of the day and also the last session of the conference for me. Uh, first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Ido Flato. I come here from Israel and that's why I have this uh, funny accent. And I rec already recognize some faces from my workshop uh, that I had in the beginning of this week about advanced topics in WCF. Um, first of all, if you want to write down, I also have it on the uh, last slide. The, uh, the slides and all the demonstration code I'm going to show is already online uh, on my SkyDrive. You can just go ahead and download it. Um, the link is at the top of the slide. Okay, it's a 1B94Z. And B, the Z is uppercase. Um, and you can just go ahead, download the demo, and check everything for yourself, see that it works. Um, just a couple of things. Come on, thank you. My computer might be running a bit slow because I'm running a virtual machine uh, in it that runs .NET 4 because to show the new stuff of .NET 4.5, I actually need to show you some of the bugs in .NET 4 which were uh, fixed in .NET 4.5, okay? Um, so my machine might be running a bit slow. Uh, at least it won't crash like it happened to me last year uh, when my uh, CPUs overheated and uh, everything crashed. So the, the air conditioning here is okay. Uh, last year it was in India, it was hot. So I cross your fingers. Okay, um, just so you um, be familiar with my work, I come from Israel, I'm an architect, a trainer, uh, a Microsoft MVP, I used to be an MVP for WCF, now I'm an, an MVP for uh, ASP.NET and IIS. I do a lot of work with the community. I, I also manage the Israeli web developers community back in Israel. Uh, so if any one of you wants to come to Israel and um, hear about web development, uh, we meet at Tuesday, the third of every month, um, just in case you're interested. And I also um, was part of the team that actually developed the Microsoft course uh, for WCF4. So if you ever did the Microsoft training uh, for WCF, you probably went through some demos, labs, uh, slides, and textbooks that I wrote. So uh, if you found anything wrong in the text, please let me know. Uh, not that we'll be releasing any new editions, just so I know that I had some issues, uh, so I'll be able to fix them. Um, so first of all, before we go ahead and talk about WCF, just want to see with a raise of hands, how many people are uh, currently using WCF 4.5? Okay, WCF 4. Okay, WCF 3.5. Okay. Um, and how many people here are using Visual Studio 2012 with .NET 4? Okay, so for all of you, as I said on my workshop on Monday, you're actually using .NET 4.5. You're not using .NET 4. Um, that's because once you installed Visual Studio 2012 on your machines, even if you are developing .NET 4 projects, uh, that .NET 4 version was upgraded to .NET 4.5 because .NET 4.5 is what is known as an in-place update. It actually changed the, w the .NET 4 assemblies. Uh, basically, for example, if you look at bugs that existed in .NET 4, uh, they will actually no longer exist on your machines if they were fixed in .NET 4.5. Okay, I showed on my workshop uh, uh, on Monday that there is a known bug in WCF in .NET 4, which we'll discuss uh, today. Uh, no, actually, I won't discuss it. There's a, a known bug uh, that you can Google for. It's known as the IO thread pool bug in WCF. Uh, it exists in .NET 4, it exists in .NET 3.5. It doesn't exist in .NET 4.5. And I tested it on my machine on Monday with .NET 4 and the bug disappeared. I tested it on a VM afterwards in .NET 4 that only had .NET 4, and it came back. So if you have .NET 4 on your machine and you have .NET 4.5, please know that you are actually developing in .NET 4.5 um, with everything that concerns that, meaning bugs will actually uh, not uh, appear on your machine, but you know when they will appear once you move to production, and in production you will only have .NET 4. So uh, think about it, if you should maybe just migrate your entire .NET 4 to .NET 4.5 in your production servers also, okay? Uh, so basically WCF, if we check the history of WCF, uh, anyone remembers the, uh, the product name of WCF? Uh, what it was called before it was called WCF? 
Back in 2005, WCF, the, the project name was called Indigo. Um, and back then it was simple soap services uh, with a few additions. And from there on, we got WCF 3, WCF 3.5, WCF 4, which was uh, um, a very uh, uh, cool uh, set of features that we got with the routing services and discovery services, um, easier configuration for WCF, default endpoints, standard endpoints, a lot of cool stuff. And then we got .NET 4.5 with WCF 4.5 only, I think it was a year after .NET 4. Okay, the first beta was already released a year after .NET 4. And in .NET 4.5, Microsoft continued adding new features to WCF, but also fixing existing problems, also enhancing the developer experience when they use WCF. So for example, the first thing that we're going to talk about regarding the new features of WCF is the ease of use and the ease of configuration in WCF. So for example, if you um, check online uh, for people and their opinions about WCF, there was actually a website uh, once called um, I hate uh, uh, this and that, and you can actually find a list of people saying I hate WCF versus people saying I love WCF, and it was about 70-30, and you can imagine what the 70% was. Okay, um, and mainly the, the reasons why people hate WCF or dislike WCF, if you uh, um, check online comments, is because the WCF configuration is very, very hard. I mean, if you think about uh, how many times you had to deal with WCF issues, for example, just close my mouse, uh, for example, debugging your service for an entire day, trying to figure out why uh, you've set the max received message size to increase the, the uh, size of the message you can handle in the service, and why it didn't affect your service, and after an entire day, uh, um, uh, coming to the conclusion that the reason it happened is because, well, um, you wrote the wrong service name in the configuration, and WCF just applied the default configuration to your service with the default setting of 65 kilobytes uh, for message size. Once you found that out, you just changed the name of the service in the configuration and everything suddenly worked. Or you tried to use TCP for your service, but it didn't work for some reason. And you checked and you found out that you were using the wrong service name. Or if you try to copy paste configuration from one place to another, suddenly you found that something went wrong because you were using binding names with uppercase for the first letter. And if you know bindings are lowercase in the first letter, unlike the class names that represent those bindings. So we had a lot of uh, issues, uh, issues with WCF. And basically some of this stuff got fixed in .NET 4. For example, we got default endpoints where we don't need to actually declare any endpoints for our service. And we get default endpoints for HTTP, for TCP, according to the base addresses that we use. Uh, we got standard endpoints. So for example, if we are declaring a max endpoint, anyone has ever declared a max endpoint? Needing to repeat that definition of uh, um, the contract called iMetadata Exchange and the binding called max HTTP binding over and over again. So we got standard endpoints that you can simply say, I want an endpoint of kind max HTTP endpoint, and it automatically declared all the binding and the contract, and you only needed to declare the address. Okay, so we got a lot of cool features regarding configuration. And WCF 4.5, and actually with the addition of Visual Studio 2012, introduces now some new features that you can actually use to easily create your services. So the first thing that we got in Visual Studio 2012 is IntelliSense for the XML configuration. So it doesn't matter if you're using app config in a self-hosted environment or web config in an IIS environment, uh, you get IntelliSense for your services. And when I say IntelliSense, I mean, first of all, the service name. So once you go ahead and type the service tag and you write the attribute of the name, you press equals and you automatically get IntelliSense with a list of all the service names you have, not only in your project, but in every other assembly that you added the reference to in your project. So now it's kind of simple to just go ahead and find the service name you need. You don't need to copy paste it from your code, copy the name, copy the namespace. Okay, you can simply pick it out. You can, you can, you can also uh, uh, simply pick WCF services that are automatically uh, uh, shipped with WCF, such as a discovery service, 
such as the routing service, that sort of stuff. Okay, so uh, it's very, very easy now to find the service name that you need instead of going to your code and copy-paste. But it's not only for a service name, also for your contract. Once you declared your service, you go and set the contract attribute in your endpoint, and you can just pick up the name of the contract from uh, the list of interfaces that have service contract attribute on them. Okay, it, not, it won't necessarily give you only the contracts of your service. Okay, it will also give you the iMetadata exchange. It will give you routing uh, interfaces. It will basically give you every interface that you can find in your either the classes in your project, the, the, sorry, the interface files in your project, or reference assemblies. <laughs> so it's now very easy, for example, to create an endpoint because you have IntelliSense for the binding name and you have IntelliSense for the contract name. So you just need to decide what the address of the service will be. Okay. We also have, as I said, IntelliSense for the binding type. So no need to remember that basic HTTP binding is with the lowercase b or figuring out if named pipe binding is named pipe or named pipes or name pipe. Uh, you can simply pick it up from the IntelliSense, okay? In addition, binding configuration, and by the way, also behavior configuration. If you ever created a behavior configuration or a binding configuration, you're familiar with that, that you create the configuration, you go ahead, you copy the name, you go to the definition of the endpoint or the definition of the service, you write behavior configuration equals, paste and then you start to go over all the other endpoints that you already have, paste the configuration here, paste the configuration here, paste the configuration there, just copy pasting all over again. Instead of that, once you create a behavior configuration or a binding configuration, you go to your endpoint, you go to your service, you add the behavior attribute, and you automatically get IntelliSense showing you all the options of existing behaviors and bindings to choose from, and you also have the option to select the empty one, and the empty one, as you see here in the image, is actually the default one, okay? Because as I said before, in WCF4, we got default configuration. So I can create, for example, a, uh, a binding configuration that has no name, and now it's the default for any type of endpoint that doesn't have any specific binding configuration. That is one thing that is also cool, but that's back in WCF4. In addition, uh, WCF IntelliSense also adds some tooltips. So once uh, um, I edit my code and I just go over and hover with my mouse cursor over the binding or over the contract, I get an explanation saying what I need to enter. Now we're all WCF developers, so we already know what to enter in a contract, but for new developers that they are told to just go ahead and insert their configuration, they might need this tooltip, okay? And the last thing, which is the cool part, at last we have validations during compilation. So if you are uh, opening a .NET 4 project, migrating into .NET 4.5, opening it for the first time in Visual Studio 2012, when you build a project, it will actually validate your web config and app config and it will let you know if, for example, you uh, manually wrote the name of the service and th that class wasn't found. Or if you're using a contract, that it cannot be found. Okay, so the compiler will automatically give you uh, validations over your configuration files. By the way, it won't mark them in yellow. I did that for the slide. Okay. Now, um, uh, um, one of the cooler features of, uh, of this feature in WCF 4.5 is that it's not actually a feature of WCF 4.5. It's a feature of Visual Studio 2012. That's why I asked before how many of you are using Visual Studio 2012 with .NET 4 projects. Because you will actually get this feature for .NET 4 project if you are using the Visual Studio 2012 editor. Okay, so just open the web config file in Visual Studio 2012. You'll get the IntelliSense whether you're working in .NET 4.5 or .NET 4. Okay. Um, just be careful not to select any new bindings that belong to .NET 4.5, such as uh, an interesting binding we'll talk about later on called net HTTP binding. Um, another thing that got cleaned up is the entire configuration in IIS. Now, how many of you are using IIS for hosting? 
Okay, how many of you are using um, both HTTP and HTTPS endpoints? Okay, or HTTP endpoints with uh, um, authentication, client authentication? No one is authenticating the clients? Wow, okay. I need to talk to a bunch of you afterwards, uh, just so we'll give me your website so I, so I can hack them easily. Um, okay, um, so just in case you don't know, when you're using IIS, first of all, uh, you can declare authentication modes. For example, I can authenticate clients in IIS using Windows authentication, meaning they have to provide their Windows identities. I can authenticate using certificates. I can authenticate using basic uh, um, usernames and passwords. The user will need to type the username and the password. It will send in simple uh, plain text encoded in Base64 to the server. Um, and you declare those settings in IIS, okay, because IIS, uh, actually provides the authentication uh, um, uh, module to authenticate those users. You don't actually authenticate those users in WCF, IS does it for you. Now the problem is, if you want to mix those modes, if you want to first of all have both Windows authentication and basic authentication, for example, for users in the domain, your service will be accessible and they will authenticate using the Windows authentication, but if they uh, try to access that service from their homes, where they are not connected to the domain, so they can just punch in their username and password using HTTPS, of course, because it's plain text, it's not encrypted in any way, and they will be able to access the service. Because IIS will test their username and password against the domain. Okay, so if you want to enable these two modes, you'll find yourself adding two endpoints. Each endpoint for each of the authentication modes of IIS. Now, when you have many services in IIS, for example, like me working on a project that has 50 different services, uh, going through a configuration, copying each and every one of the endpoints, replicating it, using different endpoint settings for the security mode, it's just tedious, okay? So one of the things that uh, were introduced in WCF 4.5 is the option to inherit the security configuration from IIS. So if you go to your security settings in .NET, uh, in the configuration file, you have that client credential type when you declare a security setting uh, in your binding. Uh, once you had basic, digest, windows, now you have those settings plus an additional setting called inherited from host. Once you choose that option, you only need one endpoint that is configured to inherit the settings from the IS host, and that endpoint will actually support several types of authentication modes. That way, it's very simple uh, to write your configuration. You just need one endpoint instead of two or three or four different endpoints, okay? Now, not only that, one of the other problems we had with um, IIS when we used WCF is the entire usage of HTTPS because if you wanted HTTP, we could just use the default endpoints of WCF. Once WCF is hosted in IIS, it creates a default endpoint for HTTP, great. But once we have both HTTP and HTTPS, we need to manually create the HTTPS endpoint. And if we want both HTTP and HTTPS, we found ourselves entering configuration for both HTTP and HTTPS endpoints. Meaning we again need to duplicate each and every one of our endpoints for each and every one of our contracts, for each and every one of our services. But the entire concept of using default configuration is that we don't need to do any of that. And that's one of the new things in WCF 4.5, that now we also have automatic configuration for HTTPS. So IIS just checks, uh, WCF sorry, just checks if IIS enables HTTP in addition to HTTPS, okay? Uh, and according to that, creates your default endpoints. So I can basically have an IIS with an empty configuration file. My web config won't even have a service uh, a model section in it, a system service model section for WCF, and I will actually get all the endpoints that I need. An endpoint for HTTP, an endpoint for HTTPS, and if I'm using NetTCP bindings, I will get a NetTCP configuration. I don't need to start configuring everything again, okay? So now, we also have a default endpoint for HTTPS. By the way, it's not secured, so if you have an HTTPS with a client credential type, but I asked before and you said you don't use it, so it's okay. Uh, so you can basically just remove every 
setting that you have in your system service model other than specific binding settings or specific behavior settings, change them to a default setting, and IIS and WCF will automatically populate your endpoints using the default configuration. So that is one of the neatest things in WCF that need uh, the, uh, the no need anymore to add extra configuration for every type of endpoint that you want. Now, it's not only on the server side that things got changed. Okay, One other thing that, that got changed was the excessive content of client configuration. Has anyone ever tried adding a service reference in their client code? I know I did. Uh, and if you ever try that, you'll probably get something like that. Uh, this is the binding configuration you get for three simple endpoints in a WCF service. By the way, endpoints that only had their client credential type being set. Okay, All of them using transport security with different client credential type. But for some reason, the client code, uh, uh, the add the service reference code, decided that it would be a good idea to enter configuration for the timeouts and the max message size and uh, uh, the type of encoding it uses and the max buffer size and whether it allows cookies or not. So basically, if you're like me, you just go ahead and, sorry, and declare all of that content uh, and remove all of that content and simply uh, keep just the things that were actually changed from the default. Because I don't know if you know that, but all of this content is actually the default content of a WCF client. The fact that it says here that the maximum uh, receipt message size is 65K, that's the default. I don't need that here. The fact that it says that the close timeout is one minute, that's the default, okay? So usually we just remove everything, hoping that the next time we update the service reference it won't edit again. Um, but if we do that, we'll simply leave only the things that we want. Now in WCA 4.5, things got a whole lot easier because now if we add the same service reference, that's all that we'll get, okay? Everything that was default is now removed from your bindings. So you might still get empty bindings just as a placeholder, but they won't have any default settings in them unless there is something that actually got changed in the binding on the service side, something that actually affects the client side. Okay, you know that if you change the timeouts on your service side or the max receive message size, it doesn't affect the client configuration, so it won't be shown. But if you change the security mode, okay, if you change uh, stuff like that, it needs to be reflected on the client side. Okay, negotiations issues and stuff like that. So let's go ahead and um, check that in code, just so you know I'm not fooling you around and it actually got simplified. Okay, so first of all, I have here a service. Um, this host, as you can see, starts and it seems okay. Um, I can check the app config here and I can see that I actually have two endpoints. One endpoint is using the basic HTTP binding. Second one is using the max HTTP binding. I also have a behavior configuration here for uh, a behavior that uses service metadata, so I can actually use max. Okay, you can't add the max endpoint without ad adding the service metadata behavior. And another binding configuration that um, configures the max received message size to one megabyte to increase it from the default 65K. Now, what I want to show you is the how easy it is to actually create all of that configuration from scratch. Okay, so first let me compile this code. Um, anyone wants to tie me? Okay. Basic binding. I'm under pressure, so I'm doing st stuff wrong. Metadata. Okay, and now for the services. This is the fun part. Services. Service. Name. Ha! Ah, no need to copy paste. Behavior. Just pick the one from the list. Endpoint, binding, basic, address, it was empty I think. 
binding configuration. Just pick the one that you need. Contract. Okay, this is the one. Another endpoint. Binding. By the way, instead of doing this, as I said before, uh, you actually have the feature of .NET 4, which simply say kind, max, address, max, and that's it. Okay. Uh, WCF, if you use this kind option, will automatically declare the contract and the binding. Uh, by the way, you, uh, you also have other kind types. For example, for dynamic endpoints, if you're using um, discovery, um, you have, for example, web HTTP endpoint, if you're using RESTful services in WCF, it simply defines both, for example, for web HTTP, it defines the binding for web HTTP binding, and, oh, let's turn it off. And it also defines uh, this, the endpoint behavior that configures the help pages, JSONP support, and that sort of stuff, okay? So if we return to Max HTTP binding, as you saw, the same definition, uh, the same configuration um, in less than a minute, I think. Anyone type me? No? Okay. Uh, without going to the code, copying the name of the contract, copying the name of the service, you all know that you, that's the way you actually do that, right? In WCF4 and uh, uh, before that. We always need to go between files, copy, and we also need to return because we need to copy first the name of the namespace and then copy the name of the service. Annoying. No more thank you, WCF team. So that's one of the options. Second option that we have is now with um, IIS. Okay, so as you recall, I told you that IIS actually supports a couple of credential types. So I actually created in my IIS configuration, um, a service, come on, thanks, a service that has a couple of credential types, and here it is, and it supports both basic authentication and Windows authentication. Okay, now normally, uh, if I wanted to support both of these modes for HTTP and for HTTPS, I needed to probably have about four different endpoints. Okay, instead of that, I'm simply um, creating the following endpoints. First of all, um, as you can see, I don't have any endpoint definition here. I don't need any, okay, because I will automatically get default endpoints for HTTP and HTTPS. The only thing I want to do is for the HTTPS endpoint, declare that I want to have uh, um, all of the types from IIS all the authentication types. So all I need to do, okay, is do the following. Create a new binding. Set that binding in the client credential type to inherited from host, okay? And then just tell IIS and WCF that to create, the HT, to create a, a, an endpoint for HTTPS, please use basic HTTP binding with the following configuration. Now, um, just so you understand what this protocol mapping is, how many people ever use the um, default endpoints in WCF4? Default endpoints? Okay. Um, as you know, in WCF4, we need to declare a base address for our services, right? Now, when you declare a base address, that base address can be HTTP, it can be NetTCP, it can be MSMQ, any kind of base address. Uh, the usage of base address is used for two things. One, for the WSDL file, if you're using an HTTP. Uh, and second, to uh, um, give you the ability to declare relative addresses in your endpoints. You give a base address and then you, um, um, you declare 10 different endpoints for HTTP. Every one of those endpoints is a relative address to the base address. Okay, so if you create, for example, a base address in HTTP and you don't declare any endpoints, WCF4 will automatically create an endpoint for HTTP with the basic HTTP binding. Why basic HTTP binding? Because that's the default mapping between HTTP and the appropriate mapping. For a base address that has NetTCP, the option is simpler. It will simply be a NetTCP binding, okay? If you want to change that, if you want to uh, uh, not have any endpoints in your configuration, but uh, uh, give the default endpoints WS HTTP binding, I can simply, in my app config or web config, it doesn't matter, add a ski mapping between 
HTTP and WS HTTP binding. This will actually create all my HTTP endpoints as WS HTTP binding instead of basic HTTP binding. It's simply a changing of the uh, mapping between the protocol and the binding. Okay, so what I did here, because I already have a default mapping between HTTPS and basic HTTP binding, I just need to tell WCF, I want HTTPS with basic HTTP binding, but I also want client authentication. I don't want to be like you that you don't have client authentications. I want to be secured properly. Not that you're not, but just in case I want to have something that secures my client. Okay, so I'm just adding, in addition to the binding, this binding configuration to point out to the inheritor from host. Okay, and just because I want to demonstrate one other thing, um, I'm adding another binding with no name, meaning it's the default one for HTTP, uh, which allows me to use transport credentials only. Tra transport credentials only will actually allow me to use client credentials like Windows, uh, but use HTTPS for that, not require me to use HTTPS. Okay, it will simply use HTTP. Uh, the reason why I, w uh, why I can use Windows authentication with um, transport, without transport itself, transport security, is because Windows is, an ident is a token that I get from Active Directory. It's not actually something that someone can decrypt and figure out the password from it. Unlike, for example, basic uh, authentication, which simply encodes it to Base64. Okay, if you have Fiddler turned on, you can actually go ahead, pull that authorization header from the HTTP message in basic authentication, uh, I'm doing a, a decode of Base64, and you'll find the username and the password with the semicolon between them, okay? Uh, so don't use transport credentials only with basic authentication, only with Windows authentication or a certificate. So once I did that, first of all, when I add a service reference, this is the configuration I get in my client side. No longer do I get all that bloated uh, um, binding configuration that has timeouts and max message size and cookies and all of that, okay? And I only get a binding that says this service is supported by basic authentication, this service is supported by Windows authentication, and another one for the transport credentials only with Windows. As you can see, this actually matches the configuration I had in IIS, although in my web config I only had one binding configuration for that. Okay? The head service reference handles everything on the client side. Once I check that, I can actually call my service using the three different techniques. Once with basic authentication, once with Windows authentication, even use the unsecure channel with Windows authentication and everything works, okay? By the way, to um, authenticate using basic authentication, all I need to do is just go to my proxy and set the username object, both username and password, that's basic authentication, okay? No need to create network credentials or that sort of stuff. So the new things that Microsoft first wanted to introduce in WCF 4.5 is the ease of use, okay? They started it with WCF 4, they moved on to try to do uh, um, other things in WCF 4.5 to make developers like WCF, okay? There's hate, there's like, there's love. So maybe in <coughs> WCF 5 we'll have love. Um, you know. Anyone likes WCF? Likes uh, closer to love, but they took my WCF MVP away, so I like WCF. I love IIS. <laughs> no, actually, I, I also love WCF. I just hope they'll add some new features uh, uh, to it in WCF 5. Now, um, one of the other cool features that WCF 4.5 introduced is at last we now have support for new transport protocols. Now, the support is new. The transport protocols are not that new. Okay, some of them are new, some of them are not. Uh, the first one that I want to talk about is um, a transport that is called WebSockets. Anyone heard of WebSockets? Okay, so how many people here are developing duplex services? Duplex services, just to remind you, um, 
you can create actually a contract that doesn't do request response, doesn't have a request and the service returns a response. You can actually create services with contracts where the client sends a message to WCF. WCF does some processing, may take it a second, may take it five minutes, uh, may take it two days. And when the service is ready, when it has enough data to send to the client, the service just opens a connection to the client and sends the information to the client. That's duplex communication. The service can talk to a client as well as the client can actually talk to the service that easily. Okay, uh, uh, for example, in TCP, it simply uses the same TCP socket to send messages in both directions. With HTTP, we have a special binding called WS Dual HTTP Binding um, to open two HTTP connections, one from the client to the service, one from the service to the client. Okay. Now, um, duplex communication in WCF is something that we had ever since day one. We always had duplex communication in WCF. But what we didn't have easily is duplex communication between non-dotent applications and WCF. Okay, for example, if I'm in a browser and I want to call a WCF service using web HTTP binding, for example, and I actually want the WCF service to return uh, some messages to me when uh, it completed the processing or maybe I'm registering to an event I want to know when that event happened. For example, I'm registering to a stock change and I want to know when that stock change occurred. Uh, I can actually go with either of the following ways. I can uh, uh, maybe uh, pull the server every couple of seconds just to ask is there anything new, is there anything new, is there anything new every five seconds. Or I might do something called long polling where I open a connection to the service, to a method that actually hangs until there is a response to send back to the client, and only then the, uh, the service sends the response to the client. Okay, that's called long polling. Now, uh, usually long polling ends up with the client having a timeout because you can't open the connection for too long. So usually what we do is we, we catch that exception, ignore that, and just open the connection again. Okay, that's long polling. Uh, there are different types of techniques to do that in, uh, uh, in JavaScript or in non-.NET applications, uh, but basically it's just awful. I mean, we don't have any duplex, real duplex communication in HTTP, okay? That, that dual, uh, WS dual HTTP binding is actually a fake. It creates two HTTP connections. Uh, I once worked in a project where there was actually a firewall uh, between the client and the server that prevented from the server from opening connections back to the client. So we couldn't use WS dual HTTP binding. We ended up using polling every couple of seconds. Okay, And that actually uh, incurs a penalty on the WCF service because it has a lot of open connections. Uh, it gets uh, uh, a recheck every couple of seconds. Um, it actually affects the performance of our service having so many clients opening a connection to a service, just checking if something uh, is changed or not. Now, uh, one of the new features that we got, not related to WCF, uh, is a new protocol for duplex communication in HTTP. That protocol is called WebSocket. WebSocket is part of the entire HTML5 standardization era. Um, I don't know if you know, but HTML5 is not only about new video and audio elements. Okay, HTML5 is about new uh, JavaScript versions and JavaScript APIs and the WebSocket protocol. Um, it's a whole bunch of standardization that is going on that has a large hat over it called HTML5. So WebSockets is a new protocol and the concept of this new protocol is to use HTTP as a bidirectional duplex communication channel between a client and the server. Or as I like to call it, it's TCP. Anyone understood the joke? No? Yeah. TCP is basically bidirectional duplex communication between a client and the server, and HTTP uses TCP. Uh, until um, a WebSocket's HTTP was restricted to not accept requests being sent from the server to the client. Uh, but TCP allows that. Okay? So basically, WebSockets is TCP by using HTTP. Uh, now, what does it allow me? First of all, I can use WebSockets and secured WebSockets, like I have uh, HTTP and HTTPS, I have WS, which, which is short for WebSockets, and WSS, which is WebSocket Secured. Okay, so I can also have a secure duplex communication between my client and my service. I can have both uh, um, textual and binary communication between the client and the service, meaning 
I can exchange not only XML and JSON, but I can also exchange images or binary data, uh, multimedia files, and that sort of stuff. Okay. Um, it's supported in most of the browsers today. I mean, most of the browsers, uh, meaning most of the new browsers like Firefox, Chrome, uh, Safari, for IE, it's supported in IE 10 and on. So if you're using old operating, uh, um, operating systems like Windows XP, uh, you'll probably need to upgrade to a newer version of Windows to support the new version of IES, uh, of um, Internet Explorer. Um, now, the only problem with WebSockets is the server side. Because we do have WebSocket implementation, for example, for Windows 2008 and Windows 7. Uh, but to actually use WebSockets from a .NET application, a server application, we need the new versions of Windows, either Windows 8, if you are using a Windows 8 server or you're developing on a Windows 8 machine, uh, or for a server, Windows Server 2012. Okay, because only Dell, for example, IIS supports WebSockets. So if you want to use a WCF service that listens to WebSockets, you actually need a Windows Server 2012 or a Windows 8 machine uh, to host that web service. Um, if not, you'll need to do some, um, you know, some uh, workarounds with self-hosting, which won't be fun at all. Okay. Uh, now, once you have WebSocket support, you can choose from either two ways. First of all, there's a new binding for WebSockets in WCF. So if you are using uh, duplex communication in WCF, you have a, a, a WCF client that does duplex communication using NetECP maybe or using WS Dual HTTP. There's actually a new binding for WebSockets called Net HTTP binding. Now, Net HTTP binding is a cool binding. I'll show it to you in a couple of minutes. It actually allows you to upgrade an HTTP connection to WebSockets. Um, uh, and if you're not using any duplex contracts, it can simply use HTTP. Okay, basic HTTP binding, even an upgraded HTTP binding, because uh, Net HTTP binding actually uses basic HTTP binding with binary encoding. Now, you all know basic HTTP binding is textual encoding, okay? So this is a kind of a custom binding that allows you to transform binary data over HTTP. Uh, I don't know how many people read uh, MSDN article about improving WCF performance in .NET client applications, but one of the recommendations Microsoft always said is that if you have .NET client applications, um, WPF, WinForms, Silverlight, um, rest in peace, uh, any kind of framework that knows how to do WCF properly, and you need to use HTTP because, for example, you're going over internet connection or through a proxy that has a firewall in it or that sort of stuff, and you're using basic HTTP binding or even WS HTTP binding, you don't actually need to use the text encoding. You can create a custom binding and use the binary encoding because binary encoding, first of all, is faster, uh, and second of all, binary encoding uh, creates a message that is smaller than the text encoding. So if you look, for example, binary encoding uh, uh, versus text encoding, it's about, it creates, uh, um, it reduces the size of the message by about 30%. Okay, so from 100K to 70K message, just from switching the encoding from text to binary. Okay, and I'm not even discussing compression that you can do over that content. We'll talk about it later on. So um, if you do have .NET clients and you are using HTTP communication, consider using net HTTP binding even if it's not duplex, okay? So um, I'll show you in a couple of uh, minutes that demo how to use net HTTP binding, but first of all, if you're using non-.NET clients, such as browsers, and you want to use WebSockets with WCF, um, you actually need to create a custom binding, but instead of using that custom binding, uh, what you can simply do is just install a NuGet package called Microsoft WebSockets. That package will automatically create that custom binding for you. It will just wrap it in a nice class called uh, um, Web Service Host. Okay, it will create the binding and the configuration to declare a WebSocket endpoint for clients that are not .NET. Okay, so for .NET, we'll use .NET HTTP with SOAP over WebSockets. For non.NET, we'll use plain text, XML, JSON, or simply 
strings and uh, send them from a client to our service using a custom binding. Okay? Now, um, this is only one of the new transport supported in WCF. We'll see that uh, um, in a while. I just want to skip to the next protocol, just so I'll be able to show you the second. And the second switch that Microsoft did was thinking about a very old, old protocol called UDP. Anyone familiar with UDP? Unidirectional, yeah, okay. Um, so first of all, in WCF 3.5, uh, the story goes like that, uh, goes like this. I've been training WCF courses ever since 2008, okay? Back then it was WCF 3.5. Uh, when I get to the part where I, uh, I talk to students about uh, um, the transport support, I always tell them about HTTP and about namepipes and about TCP. And in every one of those courses, there is a student that knows a bit more than the others, comes to me during the break or raises his hand during the lesson and asks me, well, um, if there's HTTP and TCP, is there support for UDP? You know that student. Probably there's one here. Um, and my answer was always, um, there isn't any built-in support for UDP in WCF, but Microsoft actually released a whole set of samples for WCF uh, when it released .NET 3.5, okay? And in those samples, there's actually a sample of how to build a WCF UDP transport and even a WCF UDP uh, um, listener for, IA, for IIS, because you know, IIS can also um, host services that use TCP and HTTP, okay? Now, usually that, rela that relaxed them and they went home and used that uh, sample. Um, when WCF 4 was released and we updated the course, again, those students came to me and asked me, is there UDP support in WCF 4? Uh, and I told them the same answer, no, there isn't any support. But then I talked about something in uh, um, WCF that is called discovery services. Has anyone ever used discovery services in WCF 4? Discovery services is kind of cool in WCF 4. It actually allows your client uh, to be uh, 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 ambivalent to the network it's in. You actually don't need to configure the service address in your client. You configure something that is called a dynamic endpoint. And once you um, open that dynamic endpoint for communication from the client side, it will send the UDP message to the network uh, asking where is the server that implements uh, contract X using binding Y. And if your service is listening to UDP communication using a special feature of WCFO, it will reply with the UDP message saying, I am service X, this is my address, this is my binding configuration, you can now connect to, to me, okay? That way you can actually install your service anywhere, move it between servers, have the client ambivalent to the location of the server and only find it in runtime. Now, once I told students about that, they actually, uh, um, immediately asked me, well, if WCF has discovery services and those use, T, use UDP to check where stuff are, why is there no UDP binding in WCF 4? And my answer is, I don't know, go take the sample. Okay, stop asking me those silly questions. Now, when WCF 4.5 was released, I finally uh, answered to this question, yeah, there is one, okay? Because finally they just took that UDP transport they had internally in their code and just changed internal to public. I guess they also did some other stuff. But basically for us it's just changing that internal to public, okay, that class. So UDP support in WCF, uh, you can now do it in WCF 4.5 and that is actually the first time we actually got a real one-way protocol in WCF. I don't know how many of you try to use one-way messages with TCP, for example, but one-way messages with TCP is not really one-way because TCP is not really one-way. Um, if you're familiar with TCP, with the definition of the protocol, it uses acknowledge messages. Every packet that you send to the server, the server responds with an acknowledgement saying, I got this package. So if I'm using one-way messages and my server is down, it's offline, I'll try to send the message to it, I won't get the acknowledgement, the WCF client will crash. But one way actually means that I 
I'm sending and forgetting it, uh, uh, um, um, you know, fire and forget. But in any other protocol other than UDP, I need to wait for that acknowledgement. But now with TCP, I can actually, uh, with uh, UDP, I can actually send that request and just go on with my work. Um, hopefully, there is a server online, okay? Otherwise, I shouldn't have used UDP with one-way messaging. Now, UDP in WCF also supports another cool stuff, which is multicast. Mm. If in the past I always needed to know which server I'm communicating with, I can actually now send a request over the wire so it will be handled by any server that is actually uh, currently listening to a specific uh, port, okay? Because we have multicast ports um, in, uh, um, in networks and now we have them supported in WCF. So that will actually work better, for example, if your server needs to send an update message to a lot of clients using duplex communication, so all of those clients can simply uh, listen to the same multicast IP and port and have that server send only one message to the network and that message will get to all the clients on the network. So if you have a server that uh, uh, is acting like uh, uh, a publisher for subscriptions, okay, event-based uh, programming, so it can actually send one message instead of having uh, the list of all the clients that are currently connected to the server, managing that client list, if the connection is currently open or not, just send that using UDP and forget about it, okay? Um, there are, of course, some limitations to, uh, to UDP. First of all, we don't have security over UDP in WCF, and most of all, uh, we don't have any sessions, so don't try to use the per session instancing mode of WCF, it won't work. It will simply be per call. Okay, um, now let me go on and show you some of this stuff. So first of all, let's see the UDP and then we'll see the um, WebSocket stuff. Fun. Here we go. Okay, so for UDP, what I'm going to show you is the following. First of all, let me run a couple of applications. I'm actually going to run three different applications. UDP client, UDP host, and the broadcast listener. Let's close these two. And these three applications actually do the following. First of all, the UDP service host listens to SOAP UDP. This is the new scheme for uh, UDP addresses. By the way, it's not net UDP because unlike uh, net TCP, sorry, um, unlike TCP where the, uh, the schema was defined by Microsoft, okay, and um, I don't know how many of you know, but TCP actually uses binary encoding for its messaging. Uh, UDP uses a standard SOAP over UDP standard, okay? Uh, it's part of the standards uh, done by the W3C and other organizations. There is actually a standard of how to do SOAP over UDP. Uh, it's even being used in uh, plug and play drivers. Okay, so it's not net UDP, it's SOAP UDP because it's standard. Um, basically, when Java clients uh, will know how to use UDP, they will be able to communicate with WCF using UDP. Okay. Unlike TCP, where they actually need to also learn about the binary encoding of .NET, which will never happen. But if they know textual encoding and they know how to use UDP, you can actually create a UDP client in Java that communicates with WCF. So I'm declaring an endpoint over UDP, and just for testing and comparison uh, of uh, performance, I'm also declaring an HTTP and an NetTCP endpoint. Um, all of them are for the same contract. I just want to test the speed of calling over each and every one of these transports. I'm also declaring uh, a multicast address, okay, which will um, be able to listen to multicast messaging. And just to show you that I can actually send one message from a client hitting two different servers, I have another server. This is the broadcast listener. And this broadcast listener has the same service using the same address. Okay, so this is uh, 239. And this is also 239, the same port, okay? 
So these are actually two services listening to the same, uh, um, to the same IP. And now the client will simply try and test those services and we'll be able to see the results. Okay, so we have a client here. This is the server. This is the second listener. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to send request response messages, check the performance, one-way messages, check the performance, and, uh, um, uh, and uh, one-way messages over multicast just to check if they can reach both servers. Okay, so this is UDP, HTTP, as you can see the server is running them, TCP. We'll talk about um, the results. As you can see, for multicast, both servers show the result. And now I'm doing request response. Okay, takes a bit of time. And now let's just discuss the results. First of all, um, it's clear that one-way messaging over UDP is the fastest, okay? Over TCP, it's a bit slower uh, because it needs the acknowledgement all the time. And over HTTP, it's slower than TCP, which makes sense. For request response, uh, the result is different. If you look at request response with UDP, you'll see that it's actually slower than TCP. And that actually makes sense because request response actually requires the client to send a message to the server and the server to send a response to the client. But UDP is one way. So we actually need two UDP messages, one in each direction. Okay, so we're actually opening two sockets. Okay, and that is why UDP is slower than TCP because TCP uses only one socket, uh, one connection between the client and the service to send the request and the response. Um, and of course, HTTP is slower than both of them. <laughs> okay. Now, one of the interesting parts of UDP, as I said before, is the one-way part where the service can actually be offline. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to run this stuff again, but this time I'm only going to run the client without the servers. So I have no servers, the servers are offline. I'm not using MSMQ, okay, so something will go wrong. And if we'll check that, let's see. So first of all, UDP was actually able to send the messages. Cool. Um, HTTP and TCP, I actually got an exception and caught it. Okay, so I'm throwing an exception. Uh, I got an exception from the, the client because it wasn't able to communicate with the service. I caught it and I, pro I printed a message. And of course, that if I try to use request response with either UDP, HTTP, or TCP, everything fails because I don't get any response from the service even in UDP, so I'm throwing an exception. Uh, but UDP multicast actually works. Okay, there is no problem running UDP multicast when the servers are offline. Uh, simply, no one will get that message. Yeah? Uh, why is the multicast slower in, uh, uh, in regards to uh, one way? Um, I think it's because it's sending it to a special IP and it has, when you send the UDP message, you actually need to wait for a couple of seconds to get answers. So it waits for a random uh, amount of time. And when you're dealing with multicast, um, I think that it requires more time to know if it was actually sent or not. Uh, I'm not really sure why that is. It's something to do with the protocol itself, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Um, you also ha you also see that, for example, in discovery services, where UDP communication is a bit slow because it actually waits a couple of milliseconds to get information from the message. Um, but it might be interesting to check the code and actually see if they have a waiting time or something like that. Now, this mouse is dead. I think it's out of batteries. Keep it aside. Um, and now for the WebSockets part, which I know you all want to see. So first of all, um, let me just show you the new, not this one, the new configuration for net HTTP binding. Okay, so we now have a net HTTP binding. The default behavior of net HTTP binding is, as I said, HTTP plus binary encoding, which is cool. Uh, but if you are actually using duplex contracts in your services, net HTTP binding will automatically become WebSockets. Okay, so you don't need to create two different endpoints uh, for your service. You don't need to change the configuration if you find out that you need a duplex contract. You can simply create a net HTTP binding contract, 
a net HTTP binding setting in your configuration it will support both of them. Uh, you can actually even force your endpoint to become web sockets even if you are not using uh, um, even if you are not using a duplex contract, simply by changing the configuration of the binding, okay, and in the net HTTP binding, you have the WebSocket setting. By changing the transport to always, you are actually forcing WebSockets. Now, why would I want an HTTP binding to always use WebSockets, even if it's not using duplex communication? One of the cool features of WebSockets is that it's session full, meaning I can actually have a session between a client and the server over HTTP. And um, sessions are useful because the only way to get sessions in HTTP, in WCF at least, is to use WS HTTP binding with reliable messaging, which makes our messages big, big, very big. Okay, it requires the client to communicate with the server all the time to keep that session open. It requires the client to send the message number uh, of every one of those messages that it sends to the server. So it, you can do that, but for example, if you do want a session using HTTP, you can just move to net HTTP and use WebSockets. Okay, you don't need the entire WS HTTP binding for sessions, not anymore. So I have um, four different variations of um, net HTTP binding. One uses a request response contract, one uses a duplex contract, one uses um, a request response with WebSockets, forcing the WebSockets, and all of these three are uh, binary. And I can also have WebSockets with text instead of binary if I want, for example, to communicate um, with, uh, um, say, I don't know, Java client, okay? I can actually do that if Java supported that. Now, of course, the same settings for the configuration are also on the client side. I have four endpoints on the client side, um, two of them with the regular contract, okay, uh, which is, as I said before, it's a request response, and two of them are with the duplex contract that declares simply a duplex contract. Okay, just so you know what a duplex contract looks like, if you haven't created one um, before, this is a contract. By adding the callback contract uh, parameter in the uh, contract attribute, I am making this contract duplex. Simply by saying when the service needs to call the client, uh, the client needs to implement the following contract. So I actually have two contracts in duplex mode, one for the service to implement, one for the client to implement, and if you check my client, my client is actually implementing um, this contract. It's not called in the same name uh, in the client, but it's right here, okay? I do press contract callback, I'm implementing that part in the client, okay? So that's how we, you build um, duplex contracts. You create two interfaces, one for the server, one for the client, both of them are created in the server, of course. Um, you match between the two in the contract configuration and you implement uh, the callback part in your client, okay? So my client, what it does is quite basic. I'm just calling a method in the service using the four different endpoints. And what I want to do in each of them is just to make the service, first of all, do uh, two operations to verify that if I'm using a session or not. And uh, um, I'm calling the duplex ones because I want to see that the service is actually able to call back my client, okay? So let me run the service and the host. So my host is running, it has four different endpoints, and now my client will do the following. First of all, request response with net HTTP binding, which is basically HTTP with binary. As you can see, uh, my server is counting the number of operations. It's not using a session because it's always starting back from one, okay? Uh, when I use WebSockets, because I'm using a duplex contract, I'm able to call the service. The service is able to call the client. This message by WebSockets is actually the response 
it's not a response, it's the message the server is sending to my client. But the response, as you can see, is incre incremented, meaning my um, server side instance actually supports sessions. Without changing anything in the binding, I didn't need to enable sessions or something like that. <coughs> Just by using WebSockets, I got sessions. Okay? And even if I don't use duplex contracts, even if I use request response contracts, but I am forcing the use of WebSockets, such as in this mode, I also get sessions. So sessions is part of WebSockets. Okay? And if I um, used any uh, WebSocket sniffer, uh, I actually wanted to show this demonstration using Fiddler because Fiddler, if you're familiar with that tool, you're familiar with Fiddler? Yeah? So Fiddler um, is able to show WebSocket communication, but for some reason, I'm pretty sure it worked once, but for some reason, uh, now it doesn't show me the SOAP content that the server is sending back to the client. Okay? It's throwing an exception, an object not found exception, although I do get the content. Uh, so Fiddler is currently not able to uh, debug the WCF part. I need to talk to the creator of Fiddler and check that out. Uh, but you will actually see that all of these three um, options will have used binary, which means they will use uh, some kind of binary content. You want to figure it out. Uh, but if you looked at the fourth option, you would actually see the plain text of the SOAP message, XML standard SOAP message. Okay. And just to show you that WebSockets is also supported from browsers, I'm going to have another demo, which is right here. And as you can see, first of all, my service is using the standard interface and callback interface, just like I did before. Only this time, I'm doing something nice. I am actually... Um, going and starting a thread here in the background. It's somewhere here. Oh, no, this is not the thread part, sorry. Uh, I'm actually getting a message from the client every couple of seconds, and I'm just echoing that message back to my client. Okay? As you can see, for those of you who have used uh, duplex communication before, to get the callback channel to the client, I'm simply calling my operation context, current, get callback channel. That's how I'm able to reach my client, okay? So I'm just putting it aside, and every time my client sends me a message, I'm just taking that message and I'm echoing it back to my client. Um, all the code that you see here is just to, de uh, to uh, um, decode the content because it's encoded and I need to create a byte stream from it. Okay, it's a string to a byte stream, uh, so it requires some coding. And this code, Looks like so, okay. Every couple of seconds. It's a bit of JavaScript, don't be alarmed. Okay. Um, just here you go. Uh, every one second, I'm using a WebSocket from JavaScript and I'm sending the time is and the current time. And the WebSocket, when it receives the echo, it will simply append that to a div, okay. That's it. So this is just an echo service, but you could have uh, um, sent a message to the service, please give me any information regarding the following stock, and the service will just add that information to a background thread getting stock information. Once that uh, stock information is received, it will simply take the callback channel, send the message back to the client, and the client will see that information. No need to poll the server every five seconds. Okay, I'm just keeping a connection open, it won't time out, uh, not for a long time, and my client will be able to get information once it has been updated. So I'm just typing my name. This name will be stored on the service side. And now, every couple of seconds, I'm just going to get the time, okay? Every second. That message is simply sent from my client to the service, and then the service is pushing it back to the client through the WebSocket, okay? So I'm able to do that from uh, an IIS host. I'm also capable of doing the same code using a self-hosted service. 
So I can also create a new service host, but in the configuration use this, uh, here you go, uh, this custom binding with HTTP transport, with web sockets, and byte stream message encoding. This is how we create the custom binding, okay? Uh, if you don't want to create the custom binding, you don't need to. There is a cool NuGet package as I wrote in the slide called Microsoft.WebSockets. You can simply go to your configuration, create a new WebSocket host, call the add WebSocket endpoint, and it will create a host using that custom configuration automatically. Okay, if you open Reflector and check that method, you will actually see that it creates a custom binding. Okay. <clears throat> so these are new two transports that are supported by WCF 4.5. One transport that is a bit old, one transport that is new. Okay. Anyone has another transport um, they need to be supported in WCF? So I can contact the team and tell them about it. Okay. PGM, anyone? Anyone heard of a protocol called PGM? I know of one company in the whole world that is using that protocol. No. I actually don't know what that protocol is. I just heard the name. So it's cool, PGM. Um, now, those are not the only things that Microsoft improved in WCF. Microsoft actually took some of the stuff in WCF and fixed it around. Uh, some of it got fixed because they actually fixed the .NET framework. So first of all, if you're using IIS to host your services, um, there is a known bug that was fixed in ASP.NET, not in, I, not in WCF, but it's part of the entire uh, WCF pipeline, so it affects WCF. Um, so now just to see if you ever stumbled upon that bug, how many people here are using IIS with WCF? Okay, and from uh, among you, how many people are using streaming in their services? Okay, so those of you who are, st who are using streaming with WCF in IIS, you're not actually using, using streaming because ASP.NET buffers the entire content that you try to stream to WCF. That's a known bug in ASP.NET 4 and WCF 4, okay? When ASP.NET, uh, um, when WCF is hosted in IIS, it actually uses part of the ASP.NET pipeline to get its messages because it flows from IIS to ASP.NET to WCF. Now there's a problem, a known problem in WCF 4 uh, ASP.NET actually buffers all the content in memory, part of it on the disk, and then flows it to WCF. You want to see that bug? Let me show you that bug. Okay, I have a virtual machine here running .NET 4. No .NET 4.5 is installed here. I'm using Visual Studio 2010. Okay, and I'm gonna show you two things. First of all, I have a .NET client application uploads a 150 megabyte file to WCF hosted in IIS. Um, I'll show you the amount of memory that is currently available on the machine. Just so you will see so that it is actually in memory. It's buffered in memory. And second of all, I know how many of you know that, but if you try to upload a large file to SPNet, at some point part of that file will be stored on the disk. Okay, it stores it on the disk, and then it loads it from the disk to start working on it. Um, so I'm going to show you the temporary ASP.NET files for this um, WCF hosted service. This is the folder where uh, all the uploads are stored. Okay, so it's under Windows, Microsoft.NET, Framework 64, uh, temporary ASP.NET files, and the path to my application. Okay, so let me just close a bunch of windows here and start the app. Come on, virtual machine. I really need to replace my hard drive with an SSD. That will probably improve things. Okay. Um, it's preparing the file. Give it a couple of seconds to prepare that uh, large 150 megabyte file. Pressing enter to start the upload. During that, I'm going to the temp folder. I'll try to refresh it a couple of times. Um, there is a threshold after which ASP.NET starts to save the entire content in the disk instead of in memory because it receives the stream, um, stores some of it in memory, but when it reaches, I think it's about um, six megabytes or so, you can actually define that setting 
uh, to deliver that you need, it starts to buffer that content in the hard drive. Okay, so as you can see now, the content is being stored on the drive. Let me just refresh a couple of times to see the size increase. Come on, here we go, okay? And it will increase over and over and over until it reaches the size of the stream. And after ASP.NET receives that, it loads it from the disk, passes it to WCF, and WCF starts to handle the stream. Now you can actually see that it takes a lot of time before WCF can actually handle that stream. If everything was okay, the first couple of bytes that uh, ASP.NET received should have been transferred to WCF so it can start processing the stream, right? That's stream processing. But if we look at the time, first of all, let me just zoom in a bit. Okay, not this kind of zoom. Let's do this kind of zoom. Yeah, zoom inside zoom. Let's close this one. I want to use this one. Okay. So first of all, as you can see, before I start the test, I have 264 megabytes of available memory in this VM. When WCF, when ASP.NET receives this uh, information, it has around 961, meaning it took a couple of megabytes just to create the stream. But by the time WCF receives that stream, I only have 839 megabytes, which means I have about 130 megabytes of buffer data in the memory which is not good, this is not streaming, okay? Second of all, my client started uploading uh, the content in 16 and 47 seconds. Um, client finished uploading after about 20 seconds. Now let's check the server time, okay? ASP.NET received that upload in 16 and 47, meaning at the same time it started receiving the bytes, so I know it actually started receiving. But let's see when WCF actually started receiving that content from ASP.NET. And WCF only started to get that at 17 and 6 seconds. Meaning that entire time, that, 20, that uh, 19 seconds, ASP.NET took that content, saved it to the hard drive, pulled it from the hard drive, and started passing it to WCF. WCF actually worked on that content for only a mere second. But it took another 19 seconds for ASP.NET to collect all that information. That's the bug in ASP.NET 4, okay? Now, if I run the same code, it's the same code just compiled with .NET 4.5, the result will be the following. Again, it's the same code, same client, same service, but this time the service is running under WCA 4.5. Okay, the file here is a bit bigger because this is on my machine, so I'll be able to handle a larger file, so it's a 300 megabyte file. Um, let me just process, upload, all the stuff. Uh, I'm not even bothering to show you the, the, um, the folder on the hard drive in the temporary ASP.NET files because I can assure you that file is not created on the drive, okay? And now if I zoom in just to show you the, first of all, the memory hasn't changed a bit because we are using streaming. Second of all, um, the client sent it at 1949. ASP.NET received it at 1949. WCF received it at 1950. Okay, it's probably a couple of milliseconds uh, just between ASP.NET and WCF to pass that part of the stream. But WCF actually received that content immediately after ASP.NET got it, before even ASP.NET buffered it because ASP.NET now doesn't buffer that content, it just push it back to WCF, okay? So this is the bug being fixed. This is how we actually want to see that. This is actually how we see that in WCF 4 if it's self-hosted, if it's not in IIS, okay? Because the bug is in ASP.NET. So um, which of you said they're using streaming with WCF in IIS? Um, check that, yeah, maybe. Maybe it's not actually streamed. Yeah. Okay, so the question is WCF is running in .NET 4 yeah. 
in an, in an application pool that is configured in .NET 4, but there is actually .NET 4.5. As I said before, .NET 4.5 is an in-place update. I can change my server version now to .NET 4, and it will actually work, and you will see that the bug is fixed because it's actually running a .NET 4.5 backward compatibility. And backward, com backward compatibility meaning uh, uh, be compatible with other code, but don't return the bugs, okay? So those bugs won't occur because they are part of the CLR itself, part of ASP.NET. Uh, um, so you won't see that bug in a .NET 4 application running in a .NET 4 application pool, but installed on a machine that has 4.5, okay? Um, by the way, there are other bugs, for example, um, the, the IO thread bug that I showed in my workshop on Monday. If anyone wants to hear about that, uh, come to me after the break. I'll give you a link that shows a demo of that. Um, um, the IO thread bug uh, appears in .NET 3.5, .NET 4, doesn't appear in .NET 4.5, and it doesn't appear in .NET 4 running on a machine that has framework 4.5 on it. Okay. <coughs> So in IIS, that entire stream uh, got fixed. We also have asynchronous streams for replies uh, in case our clients are um, um, loading the content slowly from the network, okay? Because when you send a response back to the client, you're using a thread. If you want to release that thread back uh, to the thread pool, so WCF will be actually be able to receive another request and start handling it without needing to create a new thread for it. You can actually say, use asynchronous streaming back to clients. Um, for self-hosting, we got the ability to compress uh, binary content in our services. We already had that in IS because IS supports compression, so it doesn't matter if WCF is using binary encoding or uh, text encoding, WCF is able to compress that content. But in self-hosting, we didn't have that option, okay? Um, so now we have compression over both binary, over text, by the way, over uh, also TCP and HTTP, because we are compressing the result of the encoding before sending it to the transport. Uh, so just to demonstrate this piece, let me just show you here. I have a WCF service that has a couple of endpoints, okay? It has an endpoint that uses Basic HTTP binding, text encoding, no compression. Uh, it has a custom binding. And this custom binding, let's just see the configuration here. That custom binding is also using uh, HTTP transport, but this time with binary message encoding. There's a third one, uses HTTP transport and binary encoding, but with GZIP. And another one using HTTP transport, binary encoding, and deflate, which is a different type of compression. IS also supports deflate and GZIP, okay? So um, one that is text, one that is binary, and two that are binary compressed. And I have another IIS host uh, with, with compression already turned on uh, using binary compression, okay? It has, here we go. It also uses a binary compression with GZIP. So let's run our client and check the result. And by the way, the result is a 100K long number, uh, which represents the 100,000 digits after the decimal point of the pi value. So if anyone wants to um, try to memorize that value, it's 3.14159265 and you can just follow it. You know, it's about um, 98,999 long. So it's big, okay? I remember 3.14159. Let's run the client. Okay, now I'm just going to call all the different services show you the size of the response. That's what we're interested in. Yeah, I also need to run the host first. Just host. Okay, so basic text encoding, it's about 100K, which makes sense. Has some uh, um, addition of the XML. Uh, binary encoding, 
a bit smaller. Usually binary encoding works better for a lot of content, uh, a lot of uh, properties of an entity with the strings and numbers. Uh, then it's able to shrink them uh, to a lower size. If I use gzip encoding or deflate encoding, as you can see, uh, gzip or deflate compression, so with binary encoding, the size is almost the same, 48 and a half K, but it's actually less than half the size of the original text message, okay? Um, if I try to do that in IIS using text encoding, for example, standard IIS compression for uh, the text encoding, it's about 64K, okay? So meaning that if I take the text and try to compress it, to probably reduce about 36%. If I take the binary and try to compress it, it takes about um, 52%, okay, of the size. And if I try to use IIS with binary encoding, as you can see, I'm even able to get a better compression rate. Okay. Now, uh, by the way, the reason why IIS does uh, this compression to a 64K and not more than that uh, is because IIS has a default compression uh, uh, ratio that tries to use as less CPU as it can. Because if you try to use too much CPU during compression, you have a lot of clients asking for requests, uh, you will get a CPU hit. Um, that is why IIS actually creates a smaller, uh, bigger uh, uh, um, size, okay? So just to, again, from one, 100K to 48K, okay? So first of all, use binary encoding because for some content, this will actually not be the same as this one. Binary encoding can reduce about 30% of the content, of the size of the content. And if you apply compression to it, you can get even to 50% even better than that, okay? 60% compression, I even saw something being compressed to 70% um, compression, meaning from 100K to 30K, okay? So take that into consideration. If you are using IIS or other people that say they're using IIS, turn on your dynamic compression in IIS. By the way, WCF4 supports this IIS compression already. So you can actually compress your content in IIS, you know, WCF clients will be able to decompress that. <coughs> if you're using 4.5, you can also use binary and compress, compress binary and get even a better performance, hit, uh, a better uh, performance ratio. And the last uh, thing that got changed is something that has to do mostly with TCP and name pipe settings. Um, how many people have ever heard of the thing in WCF called throttling? Throttling in WCF? How many people here try to load test the WCF services? Okay, it should be the same because once you load test your WCF service, you learn about throttling. Um, there is a default number in WCF that states how many requests your WCF can handle at a given time, concurrent requests. It's actually limited. There's a limitation on the number of requests you can handle. It's not limited by the number of threads your thread pool can create. It's also limited by that, but it's first of all limited by something called WCF throttling. Uh, now it's funny because that value is very, very low. In WCF uh, 3.5, it's uh, 16 concurrent uh, instances that can execute uh, code at the same time. So if you ever tried load testing your WCF services, you probably would have noticed that your service can't handle more than 16 concurrent users. Uh, in WCF 4.5, they actually changed that configuration to be based on the number of cores that you have in your machine, to be 16 times the number of cores. So on a, an eight uh, core machine, you can run 128 concurrent users, okay? Now the reason I'm telling you uh, about throttling is because this setting of, of uh, configuration that depends on core numbers uh, is now applied to another place in WCF, which is the settings of TCP and name pipes, okay? So in both TCP and name pipes, uh, some of the settings are now multiplied by the number of cores, just so they will be more accurate and matching the size of your server, okay? Um, if you've ever tried to use load testing, you'll probably find that out. So first of all, I don't have it in my slide, but there should be a very bold uh, um, message here at the bottom. Please load test your services before moving to production. At 
told the people about that in my workshop and we started to do that. Um, it's very important so you'll be able to actually figure out how many concurrent users your service can support. Is it the limit yeah. per service or the limit of all the services on that service? Uh, the limit that you set in WCF is per host. Okay, because uh, you set, um, no, it actually, no, it's per service, sorry. It's per service because your host has multiple services. Your service has this behavior settings and the throttling is set on the behavior itself. Okay, so it's per service in a host. Okay, okay so we saw uh, some of these demos. Um, I want to see if I have another cool demo to show you. We saw the PyPy calculator, the stream one, the UDP one, and the web sockets. So there aren't any more demos. You know what? If I'll have a couple of more minutes at the end, I'll show you another demo. No, I don't have a couple of minutes. So to conclude, um, first of all, the WCF team is eager to know why people don't like WCF. It's a well-known fact. People don't like WCF. Okay? Um, it's a well-known fact that some people actually hate WCF. As I said, there's hate, like, love. Um, we will try to shift from the like to the love. Uh, maybe WCF 5. So first thing, please let Microsoft know what's bugging you. Okay? Um, Microsoft is trying to uh, um, adapt new ways of thinking of how to improve WCF. They're trying to simplify the way that you create and configure services. They are always uh, trying to uh, bring new features like the UDP settings, the WebSocket support, okay? And of course, always trying to get services to the best performance that they can get. Binary compression, uh, multiplication of settings according to the number of calls. But that also requires you to actually check your services and uh, verify that you're not overusing them. Okay? Um, regarding resource, out of all of these resources, there are two important resources that I want you to know of. First of all, uh, the vNext user voice. There's a website where Microsoft actually is waiting to hear from you. So if you have a problem with the, WC, with the WCF bug that you found and you think everyone should know about it, if you have a feature that you think will be great in WCF, for example, adding dependency injection to WCF, okay, um, write it down, and Microsoft is actually taking some of this stuff and implementing them in newer versions of WCF. Okay, some of the stuff that are planned in WCF 5 will probably come from this list. Second of all, the most important part in this slide, the link at the bottom, because there you can download all the sample codes that I just showed you. UDP, WebSockets, IIS, that streaming bug, everything you can download and try. Okay, so if you want to show your bosses that you're using IIS and streaming and WCF and it's actually not working and they thought it was working, okay, take the demo, try it on your machine. Maybe it will work, which will probably mean that you have the .NET 4.5 there. Okay, um, so try out the code. If you have any questions, um, you can come to me during the break now, or you can just send me an email later on. I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Uh, already had a couple of people from our workshop sending me emails, and I answered them um, once I had an internet connection in my room, because the Wi-Fi here is just slow. And thank you for coming. Thank you for staying this late. And have a great day tomorrow um, if you are staying for the workshops. So thank you.